Well, the mind of Christ. I've been thinking about this subject for a few years uh, now and uh, how our minds and our brains and our thinking work. And uh, I'm really excited to share some thoughts with you this week as we all together try to have the mind of Christ in us. I don't think there can be any doubt, brothers and sisters, and especially young people who are probably all absent, now I think about it, so just brothers and sisters, our minds are under enormous pressure, aren't they? Like they have never been under pressure before. I mean, we live in a world that bombards our thinking with advertising, with materialism, with marketing, with peer pressure, with exponential rates of change. Wherever we go, whether it's the internet through Facebook and, and other social media, shopping malls, magazines, fashion, movies, music. The world is trying to get our minds and trying to squeeze our minds into its mold, into its particular pattern. And I don't know about you, but I think as a generation, especially our young people, we are really struggling to resist that enormous pressure. Because we likewise are trying to conform our minds to the pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's almost, isn't it, like there's this titanic struggle going on between our Heavenly Father and the world. It's like this gigantic battle, and at stake, our precious, fragile minds. They're on the line, and we are desperately holding on. Which of us are not struggling with manifesting the mind of Christ? So how important is this subject as we just begin our survey of it this week? Well, do you know, in uh, Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, we won't go there. You'll know the words, Christ summarizes the whole law of Moses. And he says, it's summarized in this, to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. It's critically, critically important. Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, let this mind be in you. So simple, it's the absolute essence of the truth. What about Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16? Paul, in Hebrews 10 and verse 16, is going to quote from Jeremiah 31. He's going to remind the Hebrews how God sacrificed all the firstborn in Egypt to get Israel out of literal bondage, and he wrote the law of Moses on tables of stone, and it didn't work. They wouldn't change. And so our God, brothers and sisters, was prepared to sacrifice not Pharaoh's, but his own firstborn son to bring us out of spiritual bondage to him, to sin. And he did that, that we might have the law written not on tables of stone, but in our minds, says Paul in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16, quoting from Jeremiah 31. He wants it written on our hearts. He wants his law to be here. And he's prepared to sacrifice his son to get it here. That's how important the subject is. And if that wasn't clear enough, what about the words of Romans chapter 8? For those that mind the flesh will die. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. It is an absolutely vital subject. Vital subject. It's the whole purpose of God's law. It's the essence of the gospel. It's the reason our Lord Jesus Christ died. And it's the singular difference between life and death is this particular subject. Our lives and the truth are all about this subject, our minds. And how precious are they, brothers and sisters? Everything else we have decays or rusts or gathers dust or is bought or sold or stolen, but our minds are extremely precious. You think about what's going to happen when Christ returns and sets up the kingdom. He's going to change our bodies in an instant, but not our minds, not our minds. Our minds are our gift to Jesus Christ when he returns. Oh, he can change our bodies just like that. And we're desperately looking forward to that time. But our minds 
are what we can give to him. Think about that. That's an amazing privilege to give to Jesus Christ something voluntarily that he doesn't have. He's got all power in heaven and earth, but he doesn't have your mind and you get to give it to him. That's, this is such a special subject. So in our lives of discipleship, this subject is not a peripheral one. You know, we talk about lots of things and without minimizing what we do talk about, this subject is not, did Jephthah sacrifice his daughter? Were Elijah and Moses really bodily there on the Mount of Transfiguration? What's the significance of the 153 fish? No, no, no. This is not a peripheral subject. This is one that is at the very heart, the very center of the truth. This subject we're going to look at together is the truth. So it's not a peripheral subject. It's also not an abstract subject. The mind of Christ is not like a lovely but lofty sounding phrase. The mind of Christ. Like it's some mystical, intangible, abstract, unexplainable concept. It is a concrete destination. It's where all of us are heading by God's good will, and it has to be completely understandable for every single one of us. So it's not peripheral, it's not abstract, and lastly, it isn't an optional subject. This is not like an extracurricular topic for the brighter students only. This is not like a difficult concept just for intellectual disciples like Brother Jeff Higgs. I'm sorry, Brother Jeff, I did try to say that without smiling. It's not like that, is it? It is not that kind of subject. It's at the very heart of who we are. It's like having faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And without having a mind that is thinking on spiritual things, Romans 8 verse 8 says, we cannot please him. This is not optional. This is at the very core of who we are. So extremely important this week as we look at this subject together. Now, how are we going to break up our topic this week? Well, you'll forgive me if you would break it up different to myself. So I ask for your uh, forgiveness right from the start. But here's how we plan on looking at this subject together. Firstly, today, we want to look at the carnal mind, the problem that we all have. So I apologize in advance. Today is a little bit negative because we really need to come to grips with the problem before we can even begin to contemplate the solution. So in our class tomorrow, we're going to look at the spiritual mind. It's the exact answer to the carnal mind in our lives. Because we've only got five uh, classes, we don't have uh, the time this week to look at the class that leads us from here to here, which is the process transformation, the renewing of our minds, the way in which the word of God changes us from here to here, that's what we're going to have to unfortunately just skip out because we just don't have time. In our third class, we want to look at what is the mind of Christ in principle? If you were to distill it down to its very essence, what is it? In our fourth class, we want to look at how we might practice it. How are we going to put this into practice in our lives? So we're going to try and hold uh, quite a few exhortational practical thoughts until class number four. And finally, in our last class, we're going to look at the power of the mind of Christ. How understanding the things that we talk about this week should, not just can, should utterly change who we are. Well, we're going to begin, as we said, with the problem this afternoon. We've got to start at the beginning, the foundation of the world. And our objective this afternoon is to make sure that we realize the enormity, the complexity, the desperate nature of our problem, the problem we all face as Adam's offspring. We have to realize that we're all of us desperately sick. Many of us look like we are the picture of perfect health and vigor, strength, right? But unfortunately, we all have this crippling disease. We are terminally ill. We are blemished, crippled. We have a disability. Paul calls it in Romans chapter 8, the carnal mind. Brother Thomas calls it a hideous deformity. 
Now, being part of Adam's offspring is not our fault. As we know, we didn't ask to be born into the constitution of sin. Human nature is, as we know, our misfortune, not our crime. But we must know what a proneness to sin is and how it works, how our minds work, before we can ever strive or after or appreciate something that is infinitely better. Before we can ever be cured, healed, made whole, we must know our sickness. So I'd like you to come, if you will, to Genesis chapter 1 and the very start of our story at the foundation of the world. We all know this verse extremely well, but let's lay a good foundation for a couple of minutes in these things. Genesis 1 and verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. It was always God's intention for man and woman to have dominion. It's again there in verse 28. And in order that mankind might have dominion, they were given two things, the image and likeness. Now, we know that image relates to the physical form of mankind. Physically, we look like the angels. We know these things. But likeness relates to our mental capacity. Here's what Brother Thomas has to say about likeness. While image, then, hath reference to form and shape, likeness hath regard to mental constitution or capacity. From the shape of his head as compared with other creatures, it is evident that man has a mental capacity that distinguishes him above them all. In fact, their likeness to him is faint. They can think, but their thoughts are only sensual. They have no moral sentiments or higher intellectual aspirations. Adam's mental capacity enabled him to comprehend and receive spiritual ideas, which moved him to veneration, hope, conscientiousness, etc. So likeness is mental capacity. But we know, don't we, that it's not just increased intelligence. It's not just that we have a bigger brain, because as we know, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 7, is going to explain or translate image and likeness when he says, for as much as man is the image and glory of God. Image and likeness, by the time we come to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 7, is image and glory, and glory is God's character. So it's not just more intelligence, it's the ability to emulate God's glory, his character, his mind. It's a chance to think like him. We have a mind that can grasp eternal things. What a distinction from the beasts. To have dominion over our thoughts, that's what we're really being asked to do. This was God's plan right from the first chapter of the Bible, to create a people who would think like him. And fulfilling that capacity is going to be his quest of 7,000 years. So it was this ability to think like God that should have enabled Adam and Eve to exercise dominion. Now, we know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent deceived Eve and sin entered the world. And if we turn over the page, we know the words of Genesis 3, verse 15 very well. And if we were to summarize it on the screen, it looks like this. I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. And if we were to ask ourselves, what was that enmity? It was now two ways of thinking. Before... There had only been peace and harmony in the garden. But now there were two people who previously had thought like God, but now had the carnal mind. There are now two ways, God's mind and the carnal mind based on the serpent's words. One was the truth and the other one was a lie. We know this pretty well, don't we? The enmity really is a different way of thinking. It's... Friendship with the world. It's uh, having a mind or that's lusting after the things of the world. These things are contrary one to another, says Galatians 5. The flesh and the spirit. The carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. 
This is not uh, a literal battle between females and snakes. This is a battle of ideologies, ways of thinking, different minds. Those who believe the truth as Eve first expressed it and those who believe the lie that the serpent was the father of. So we find as we go through Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that the answer from God was going to be a singular man. He, the seed of the woman who would come and crush the serpent's head. As he did that, he would be temporarily bruised, but he would permanently destroy him that has the power of death, that is the diabolos. And so we find that we're going to go from being the seed of the serpent by baptism to being the seed of the woman. We go from being in Adam to in Christ. And if we were to be very strict about how we used the phrases of Romans chapter 8, we would say that we go from having a carnal mind to a spiritual mind, a mind that only thinks carnal things to a mind that should be only thinking spiritual things. But we have to ask ourselves this question. We go in baptism from being in Adam to in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. But ask yourself this. When you came out of the waters of baptism, did God alter your thinking? Did God give you a mind that only thought spiritual thoughts? That was now devoid of any kind of sinful impulse? No, it doesn't happen, does it? Herein lies the problem. Because baptism is only the start of being in Christ. Baptism means that we are now constitutionally saints rather than sinners. But baptism doesn't mean for a second that we are free of the tentacles of carnal thinking. We might not have a carnal mind that's just dead set in the way of sin, like maybe Paul is using it in Romans chapter 8. We're no longer dominated solely by the uninhibited thinking of the flesh. We all know, but we all know that now, even after baptism, there exists the capacity the ability to think carnal, fleshly thoughts. And as many of us know from our own experience, actually, in the battle that rages in our minds between the thinking of the flesh and the thinking of the spirit, baptism's only the beginning. It's not the end. It only gets harder. The more we know about the thinking of the spirit, the battle gets more difficult. So herein lies the problem. If only it was so simple that we just got baptized and we're in Christ. Our minds are changed. But no, this is the effort of a lifetime, thinking like him. And so we still have the enmity in our minds. We've all inherited from Adam and Eve a mind that is naturally contrary to God, that even the waters of baptism did not wash away. And it's this way of thinking that is not subject to the law of God, as we can read in Romans chapter 8. Neither indeed can be. This way of thinking cannot be healed, it cannot be cured, it cannot be restored, it cannot be fixed. It's part of a nature that has to be destroyed by our Lord Jesus Christ, replaced rather than rehabilitated. Do you know, in Isaiah 65 and verse 25, we have a beautiful picture of the kingdom. You'll know these words. It says that the wolf and the lamb will feed together, together. The lion will eat straw like the bullock, all of them, docile, gentle, tamed. And then it says, and dust will be the serpent's meat. He ate dust in Genesis 3, and he's eating dust in the kingdom. Isaiah 65, verse 25, the thinking of the serpent is completely unchanged. We have a serious problem. We grow up and develop a mind that is naturally opposed to God, and we can't heal it. It's powerful enough to destroy us. It's cunning enough to baffle us at every turn. We can't trust it. We can't cure it. We can't educate it. We can't change it. It's the biggest problem that anyone has ever faced, and 99% of the people living out there have no idea even what it is. They're wildly ignorant of its devastating power. So what is it about this particular mind, this human mind, that makes it so destructive? How does it work? How does such a small thing create such havoc? 
Well, I want to just deviate a few minutes away from the scriptures and just um, give you a little physiology lesson, which I hope will be helpful as we go through our week together and look at what we're really up against. I want to talk about um, a model of the human brain, which uh, was sort of conceived about 50, 60 years ago, and it's very, very simple. All right, very simple. I'm not saying that it's scientifically perfect or provable because I think splitting the mind, the brain into 10,000 parts would be oversimplifying what we now know is the most complex thing in the entire universe. Did you know that? The human brain is the most complex thing in the entire universe. So to split it into three parts is kind of over, over, oversimplifying it. But so that we can understand it, this is what I'm gonna do today. At the base of our brains here, we have the brain stem, which we're going to describe as the reptile brain. In the middle, we have the mammal brain, which is like our limbic system. And right along the front, where we think, all the way across the back, we have the human brain or the neocortex. It's a pretty basic breakup of the brain. So we have the reptile brain the mammal brain, and the human brain, and this is what a brain actually looks like. It uses the characteristics of these three different types of animals to loosely describe the differing functions of these different parts of the brain. I think all of you can probably readily appreciate that whilst we might hold a lengthy conversation with a human, we probably wouldn't hold a lengthy conversation with a horse. Humans are different to horses. Human brains are different to mammal brains. Uh, whilst we might feed a horse or a mammal from uh, our, uh, our hands, feed them an apple or some oats from our hands, we probably wouldn't do that with a crocodile. Horses are different from crocodiles. And in the same way, these different sections of our brains have different responses, which are not unlike these animals. So what I want to do for just a few minutes is kind of come to grips with these three sections and see if we can identify firstly some physiological warning signs associated with how our natural brain operates. We'll go over this pretty quick. Here's the reptile brain, this brain stem here. It's controlling for us aggression, dominance, hunger, feeding, temperature control, sexuality and mating, exploration, and our territory. This is what we call feeding, fighting, and fleeing. This is where we do the basic stuff. The basic stuff. This is our instinctive brain. And it's what Brother Thomas calls in Alpha's Israel propensities. So, this is basic operations right at the back, on the top of your neck. Then, in the, right in the middle, we have our mammalian brain. It's starting to think about nurturing young, caring, our memories, social cooperation, pain or pleasure, protection, learning. It's our memories and emotions. This is our emotional brain, what Brother Thomas calls our intellect. And lastly, along the top, we have the human brain, which is our neocortex. This is where we, can, we think about language, abstract ideas. We perceive things, concepts, planning, logical reasoning, decision-making. This is where we have foresight, hindsight, and insight. This is where we reason and plan and worry and invent. This is the analytical brain, or what Brother Thomas calls moral sentiments. So just to put up a wee summary, We've got our instinctive reptilian brain down the bottom. That's about fighting and self-defense. We've got our emotional mammalian brain, which thinks about memories and emotions. And we've got this part of our brain, which thinks about logical reasoning and decision-making. Now, it may be true that whoever came up with this uh, concept of the brain was believing in evolution and thought that we just added bits on. I think we all know that's complete nonsense. This is God's design. But the way in which it works is very interesting because physiologically, the parts, these parts of our brains operate quite differently. So we don't have the time to look at it, but I was going to take you to Psalm 42 and just show you how in Psalm 42, what David does is he feels worried 
and alone and overwhelmed, he asks himself, why are you disquieted, O my soul? I'm feeling upset, he says. And then he waits and allows himself time for his logical human brain to respond and to tell him what he should think about. But we don't have time to go to Psalm 42. So let's just recap for a second from Genesis. God's purpose for us was to have dominion over the animal kingdom. But we lost that dominion when Eve believed the lie of a reptile. And ever since that day, we have greatly struggled with this part of our thinking, pleasure and self. We've conquered every animal and put them in zoos. We've hunted many of them into extinction, but there's one that we can't seem to tame or conquer or subdue, our own serpent-like thinking. Now, maybe you know the problem with our brains, uh, but let me tell you. It's how they work in real time. When we're confronted with a problem, there is actually a huge discrepancy between how fast the different parts of our brains work and here's how it happens. Our reptilian brain here, our instinctive brain, has lightning fast reflexes. It's capable actually of reacting in two milliseconds. When there's a problem, just like that, it has decided instinctively in the blink of an eye, it's tried the case and decided in favor of self. But our analytical brain up here, where we can think of the best solution, where we make more sensitive, more thoughtful, selfless decisions, is way, way, way slower. It has some major handicaps. It takes almost a whole second before this thinking part of our brain even starts working. And when it activates, it still takes about 200 milliseconds before it can respond. So it's about 100 times slower than this instinctive part of our brain. It starts the race seconds after the starter's gun, and it can only crawl at a snail's pace. It is way behind. And if you thought that was a disadvantage, it gets worse. Because our reptilian brain feels threatened sometimes, and when it does, it starts to monopolize the blood flow. It literally steals the blood from our analytical brain and feeds it to this part of our brain, which is dealing with instincts so that we can initiate those well-known fight or flight reactions. And then as our instinctive reptilian brain goes into overdrive, we get shallow, fast breathing, and all the blood sent to the muscles so that they're ready for action and the thinking brain is even more behind. So oftentimes, we have an analytical brain up here. This is the part that constitutes 70% of our brain, but it needs a rich supply of oxygen and nutrients to work, and it's not getting anything. There is literally no thinking going on. There's only the reptilian mind running rampant. In fact, you can't actually think even if you wanted to. The reptilian brain is getting far ahead of the human brain. It's hijacking the nutrients and the oxygen. This is called proneness to sin. And we can see it in ourselves. Someone triggers us. Someone maybe runs in from that door and threatens me. And maybe if I'm uh, feeling extremely upset and angry and, and, and very threatened, I might um, do something like lash out, defend myself. I might th even throw a punch. But then if I wait a second or two, my emotional reaction comes shortly after and maybe I, I start arguing and I get upset and angry. And then lastly, our analytical brain reaction might come minutes or days later and we realize it's, I need to respond in a more Christ-like manner, right? I need to be patient and lay down my life, or something like that, right? We think about these things after the fact. What happened? Our thinking brain just got hijacked, and we were almost powerless to respond. We responded a little bit more like an animal. We lashed out, we got angry or bitter or upset, we said some things we regretted. I don't know if you've ever felt this in your life. 
if, you, if you've ever experienced any of these things. What about road rage? Someone swerves in front of us, and we believe they've swerved into our territory. That's my piece of the road. Like, I own the road. And so we, uh, we suddenly feel aggressive and angry, and we honk, or we drive obnoxiously. We overtake them and slow all the way down so that we annoy them or do something like that, which is what I used to do when I was younger. What about hunger? You know, food can stimulate the pleasure center in our brain. And if you are a man, you know this feeling very well. You may have just eaten. You may have had an excellent supper. You might even be full. But the moment you walk out there after tonight's study and smell the barbecues, <gasps> you eat. Right? This is how we work. What about prospect of power, dominance, control, earning big dollars, it stimulates greed in our minds, and we do irrational things, like we buy a lotto ticket. But we take absurd risks. We invest in some crazy scheme. We're not really thinking because we're being distracted by the prospect of enormous power or wealth immediately. What about obsession with self-image? Advertisers know how to stimulate self-loathing and anxiety and jealousy. These base instincts, they advertise products by using attractive people, wearing or holding them. And our reptilian brain responds in two milliseconds with jealousy. We want to be like them. In fact, we want to be better than them. We're deceived into thinking that if we buy that perfume or that car, we'll be just as attractive and just as successful as that amazingly handsome or beautiful woman that's standing next to the car or the perfume. And next thing, our thinking brain is shutting down and we're spending hundreds of dollars on crazy stuff like anti-wrinkle creams, plastic surgery, and it goes on. Not us, not us. I'm talking about the world. Run to extremes, this crazy carnal way of thinking leads to addiction. We can be addicted to very many things. Alcohol, drugs, lust, work, food, anger, self-image, resentment, checking emails or our phones, dependency, all addictions apart from one, which we'll discover by and by, are harmful. It works by the emotional part of our brain burning a memory with our basic instincts. And we, want to, we get pleasure when we exercise this. So we want to, because it makes us feel better, we want to go back and do it again. So we exercise our basic instincts instead of our emotions, which by the way are not bad things, being influenced by our careful reasoning and thinking from the scriptures. That's how addictions happen. And we're all addicted, by the way, in case you were thinking, well, I don't think I'm addicted, you are addicted to yourself. And our brains are very capable of doing crazy things. Just to give you a very brief example, which probably doesn't touch the lives of very many of us, so maybe you can feel a little bit more comfortable. What about gambling? All of us know that casinos only exist because usually they win. Do we agree? Okay, so we all know that. We also know that gambling's wrong. It's not scriptural. It's an irresponsible use of the money that God has given to us. But if we walk in there and suddenly we feel a little bit of greed, a little bit of ambition, and suddenly we think we might win something all of a sudden that we haven't earned, we get an amazing dopamine rush and our neocortex shuts down and we put another coin in the pokey machine. It's quite a natural reaction for the emotions of the carnal mind to be controlled by the instincts like this. And so all of a sudden, we just keep doing it. And all of the family pay packet for the week goes into the pokey machine. And then we can't do it anymore and we drive home with, what was I thinking? Oh, the answer was, you weren't really thinking. Your thinking brain had been hijacked. This is what happens. Do you know that researchers tell us that the instinctive and emotional part of our brains actually performs up to 95% of our functions? That's telling us, I hope that's not true with us as Christadelphians, but that seems to be true with everyone in the world. That's telling us that our logical thinking brain where we can think about spiritual things, 
when we can ponder the mind of Christ, may only be getting a chance 5% of the time. So this is the impulse to sin. This is our enemy. It's a civilized insanity. It's billions of people out there just simply not thinking. The brain has hijacked and sabotaged itself. It only takes a simple trigger and our instincts are off. And man, can they be hard to stop sometimes. Our ways and our thoughts are definitely not God's ways or thoughts. Now, I want to be absolutely clear about one thing. We are not trying to say that the thinking of the carnal mind is just a chemical reaction or a physiological thing. We're not saying that the carnal, that carnal thoughts will always be able to be overcome by just simply thinking more by giving the thinking brain time to kick in and override our craziness. We're not saying that. But what we are saying is that this physiological hardwiring of our brain is a big part of our problem. This is a big part of the picture. We are naturally hardwired to just think about ourselves, and overwhelmingly so. Second of Timothy 3 says, we're lovers of ourselves more than lovers of God. Now, it's amazing how strong this carnal mind, unenlightened by divine truth, can be. You might have heard of this experiment. It's from 1953. Peter Milner and James Olds, both neuroscientists at the McGill University, right here in Montreal, Canada, did an experiment with rats. They plugged electrodes into the pleasure center of their rat brains, and they taught them that by pushing on this little lever, this metal lever, they could stimulate their brains with a little electrical current. And that would stimulate the pleasure center in their brains, and they would feel good. So it was really an experiment to simulate what would happen in the human brain if we just thought about pleasurable things. Do you know what happened? These rats did nothing else. They ignored food. They ignored drink. They didn't sleep. They didn't even mate. They pushed that lever until they died of exhaustion or starvation. That's the power of the carnal mind. It is insatiable. We can never satisfy ourselves. Uh, But that's just rats, you say. Is it? I don't know whether you can see the similarity between these two pictures. CNN reported in January 2015 that a Taiwanese man died playing video games for three days straight without stopping to eat or drink, or sleep. I mean, who does that? Who in their right mind does that? And incredibly, the article went on to say he was the second person to die of this that month. People eat, they drink alcohol, they do drugs, they base jump, they play video games to excess till they die, brothers and sisters. This is the carnal mind running people's lives to the edge of oblivion. Without God, it's just an endless, fruitless search for pleasure, entertainment, indulgence, trying to fill a hole, satisfy a need that only our Heavenly Father can fill and satisfy. And left unattended, unconfronted, unchallenged, it just grows and grows and grows in strength and skill until our minds are like Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 20, his mind was hardened in pride, and it is very difficult to change. So what does a carnal mind look like? What does the hardened carnal mind look like from the scriptures? Well, it's just a simple word search, so let me share it with you. Let's build a picture, very briefly, of a portrait of the carnal mind, and by extension, carnal thinking which, as we've said before, we're all capable of indulging in even after baptism. I'd like you to come to Ephesians in chapter 4. Now, 
Ephesians chapter 4 in verses 17 to 19. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Here's a portrait of the carnal mind. It alienates and isolates us from God. We are separated, as Isaiah 59 puts it, from by our sins, from God, from others, from ourselves. Here it says we're alienated from life itself, from the life of God. We are separated. We are enemies in our minds, Colossians 1 verse 21. You can look this up in your own time, but Ezekiel chapter 23 talks four times in the chapter about Israel being alienated in their minds. And in the margin, it has disjointed, disconnected. Have you ever come to a Bible school like this, brothers and sisters, and had a moment or two or three where you felt like lonely? Like there's a hundred brothers and sisters who you love and who love you, and who all love the truth, and you feel just a little bit out of it, that's really carnal thinking. The, the carnal mind is not just alienated, it's also hardened. Colossians 2 and verse 18 says in the Revised Standard Version, puffed up without reason by our sensuous minds. The carnal mind is filled with pride. We become bloated by our own self-importance. It's defiled and impure, Titus says. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. And we're going to talk about our conscience tomorrow. It's angry and hostile. It says in Acts 14 that their minds were evil affected against the brethren. And we can be like this, can't we? We lead disagreeable lives sometimes. People in the world are like this. No one can satisfy us. Nothing's ever good enough. You know people out there who are like that? Cannot ever be satisfied. They're given to greed and excess. It doesn't matter how much money or fame or power we get, it's never enough for the carnal mind. It's chasing after wind. Peter says we run, we can run with them to excess of riotous living. Here's one I do want to look at very briefly. The carnal mind progressively corrupts us. Very quickly, come to 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. It says there, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, your minds, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in truth, that is in the truth. So the first thing that happens with the carnal mind is, it says, I... Uh, it's not simple. The truth's not simple. It's a lot more complicated than that. There's like more than one truth. It can't be that simple. This is Donald Trump's alternative facts. Life's more complicated. And then what happens is we come to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5. And we're told there that it says... Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. So we start out by saying, well, maybe it's more complicated. There's more than one truth. Now we progress to saying that our, that we, uh, we, our minds become destitute of the truth. And lastly, when you turn over the couple of pages to 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 8, we read about Jannies and Jambres that we'll probably look at this week who withstood Moses so do these also resist the truth. So we go from saying it's not just the simplicity of the truth, it's way more complicated, there's more than one truth for sure, to being destitute of the truth, to resisting the truth. See what happens? Unchecked. The carnal mind does not stay idle. It doesn't stay still. It progressively gets worse. We become more and more entrenched in our behavior. More proud, more greedy, 
more lustful, more resentful, more, more, whatever it is, progressively corrupted. It blinds and deceives us. We, we're willing to find fault in everyone else, unwilling to examine ourselves. Sometimes we're completely self-deluded. It's vain and empty. We've got thousands of cemeteries full of long-gone people who once lived vibrant lives, important lives in their own minds, but without God, it's all breathtakingly empty. The carnal mind is doubtful and anxious. We lead lives of fear, anxiety, worry. We fret over things beyond our control. We're over-anxious about our finances, our job security, our lovability. We can be spiteful and cruel. We can indulge in a little sarcasm at the expense of Brother Higgs, which we shouldn't really do because we love Brother Higgs. But we do it in the moment. We're forgetful and unmindful. We live we can't live in the present. We're, we're obsessed about anything but the present. No people about this like this. We obsess about the past and the future so that the present is never treasured or enjoyed or savored. We're so concerned about other things that we, we forget the simple things in life, the important things. We hop into bed at night and, oh, the daily readings. Okay, I'd better do one of those. Forgetful and unmindful. And lastly, we are unstable and easily shaken. We lead lives where we feel unsettled, restless, never ever content, never at peace, always searching. Go for another OE, something. We can never be settled and at peace. This is a portrait, brothers and sisters, of ourselves before God entered our lives. We've all felt like this. Isolated, angry, greedy, blind to ourselves, racked with fears and doubts, mean-spirited, restless. And there is one thing that characterizes this kind of mind. It only ever leads to death. For to be carnally minded is death. I mean, look at that, brothers and sisters. It is horrible. I mean, honestly, who wants this? I mean, the world looks sparkly and full of tempting opportunities. But would you leave the truth for this? Jeremiah says, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There is no mistaking the Bible's estimate of what unenlightened human nature looks like. We all grow up desperately ill. We're powerless to help ourselves. Unaffected by our loving Heavenly Father, we get progressively worse and worse until we are dead. It's a dreadful Dreadful self-portrait, isn't it? This is a picture of how God sees us standing by ourselves. And Jeremiah is moved to exclaim, who can know it? Well, actually our Heavenly Father does. I know the things that come into your mind, he says, every single one of them. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it? With a wicked mind, our God knows our minds. He created them. Ezekiel 38, it will come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind that shall have an evil thought. God knew about Gog's thoughts thousands of years before he was born, brothers and sisters. Our Heavenly Father knows our problem. Of course he does. And he has the answer. He has the solution that every psychologist Every self-help book is missing. The cure to the disease that racks our minds. The solution to the enmity, the battle, the daily struggle in our minds. He has the answer. I'd like you to come to Mark chapter 9, just very briefly in conclusion. Although we're not going to examine the mind of Christ, particularly from the Gospels, we will try and, uh, and touch down in the gospel records in each study to see the point we're trying to make in the presence of Christ himself. And in Mark chapter 9, we read in verse 17 that one of the multitude, some unknown man, representative of all of us, comes up to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he says, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. This man represents all of us. He brings his son to Jesus, and he's afflicted with terrible epilepsy, a disease where the mind loses control of itself. Sound familiar? And we read in verse 20 these words. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long ago is it since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe... All things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many of them said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. This is a marvelous story, a parable about how our Lord Jesus Christ confronts the carnal mind. This is a problem in verses 20 to 21 of nature, not nurture. He's been born with this affliction. This is a picture of the carnal mind in all its awfulness. His mind is completely unstable. He's throwing himself, groveling on the floor, on the ground, groveling in the dust. He's got serpent thinking. And look what it does. In verse 22, it's trying to destroy him. There's no self-control and there's no peace. In verse 22, we can see how his father is involved in his son's agony. Have compassion on us. And help us. We all have the same problem inherited. His compassion for our plight. If you can do anything, the man says. And Jesus Christ says, I can do all things. This is the offer of our Lord to solve the problem that we cannot solve. To cure a mind that's intent on killing us. And this father knew it. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. We've got to believe, brothers and sisters, that there is a power out there in the heavens above that is bigger and stronger and deeper and wider and longer and broader and more powerful than our own minds. This is our challenge this week. Do you know, I'm amazed when we think of the incredible complexity of our minds that anyone can ever think that we evolved, that we came to be the people that we are as just the process of evolution. Look at that portrait of the carnal mind. It's awful. This is what Brother Collier says in The Guiding Light. I think these are very insightful words. We yearn for communion with something higher than ourselves. We have ideals that make our our own attainments seem contemptible and sometimes even disgusting. How strange it would be if creatures evolved themselves out of shapeless slime and if we did, that that we should, along with the need for the food that had nourished them, develop a spiritual hunger for something that never existed and never could exist if evolution were true. How strange if they should have their own bestial instincts evolve ideals that made them miserable because the animal desires continually prevent attainment. He's saying the fact, brothers and sisters, that we have a spiritual hunger in us for something higher, outside, bigger than ourselves, must be the ultimate proof against evolution. And it's true, brothers and sisters. It's true. Our Heavenly Father is the answer to all of our problems. I know, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith Yahweh, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Our minds might be dead set against God, but his mind is only for us. It's only for our good, for our welfare, for our rescue. We, brothers and sisters, have been offered 
the solution to the one thing that is driving every other human being crazy. We've got God's solution to the carnal mind. It's our nobler portion. It's our hope. It's our Heavenly Father's antidote. It's called the spiritual mind. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And it's this amazing gift, this promise of a spiritual mind that we'll consider in our class tomorrow, God willing.